All right. Sorry about all the. Sorry about everything. <clears throat> so we had a technical issue, a miscarriage, <clears throat> an abortion, whatever. Uh, so we lost the last 10 minutes. Uh, my bad. I don't know what happened. I wish I did so I could prevent it from happening in future. Uh, Oh, great. I was unmuted when I was finagling with my microphone. Cool. So <clears throat> I've got to get a better microphone for starters uh, so that people don't hear all the breathing because that's pretty embarrassing. I don't listen to these <laughs> very often, so I've got to figure out where we are. We're just going to reread the top of the uh, segment with Margaret Ring Blair, and then we will go about our day uh, catching up to where... Uh, where we were. Uh, so I'm going to reread the last, I don't know, minute or two uh, of material. Again, sorry. I don't know what caused it. I wish I'd been alerted to it sooner, but uh, unfortunately, software was like, oh, that'll be too easy. Margaret Ring Blair was standing and waiting nervously for Char outside the door to Caecilia's office. "'Are you really taking off?' she asked when he emerged. "'It looks that way,' he said. "'I think this is it. Take care of yourself, Margaret.' "'Thank, thank you, Commander.' There were other secretaries and aides watching in the reception area, so he merely touched her elbow. She immediately sensed his meaning and moved to open the door for him. Once outside, he turned to her. At this point, Margaret, he said, the most important thing is to survive. Don't do anything rash. It's better to be a coward in this business. Look out for yourself. But she started to say something, but stopped. Don't worry about me, he said, placing his lips on hers. I'll come back alive. Give me a sec while I figure out what Windows just tried to do. Windows, what did you do? I don't know. Okay. Sorry about that. The rounded shape of the Madagascar, a Zanzibar-class cruiser, lay at rest on the darkened flight deck of Abo Aku, ready for launch. The mobile suits and the Elmeth that made up Commander Shar Aznable's new type unit had already been loaded. Well, said Lieutenant Chalia Bull, turning to Char with a grin, where do we rendezvous with our Federation date? The enemy white base ships apparently in Field 660. We don't know where one other ship in the unit is, but we'll aim for Field 600. Why? Cusco Al chimed in. Because that's where the Gundam apparently sank a Musai cruiser, said Char. Was Emerald Ray the pilot? Chalia laughed. What had once seemed a game to Cusco Al was clearly turning very real. Who cares what his name is, Cusco? he asked. I don't know. It just seems a shame to kill him. He wasn't a bad kid. To Chalia, her attitude had overtones of feminine sentimentality, and he decided to rectify it. Well, don't let your own abilities go to your head, he said. Judging from what the commander has said, the... Kid is a crack MS pilot, and there's a strong possibility he may kill us instead of the other way around. Cusco was taken aback. She knew Chalia was right, but she had a competitive streak in her. She had been raised to ignore the differences between men and women, and she believed people should be judged on the basis of talent and ability, not gender. But war tended to wreak havoc with everything, and that was another reason she hated it. It's not like you, Cusco, Chalia continued. You, of all people, should have a healthy respect for new type abilities. After all, you're the one, you're the one this Amaral Ray character nearly vaporized earlier, right? Char and Chalia left, the, left for the Madagascar's bridge, and Lieutenant Junior Grade Cramble came over to console Cusco. 
She tried to avoid him by climbing in the cockpit of the Elmeth, but he called out after her. Ah, don't take it all hard. Charlie is just being his usual pompous asshole self. He's just trying to make himself look like a new type. Thanks, Cramble, but don't worry. I'm okay. She didn't think much of Cramble, and she never could understand why he fancied himself a ladies' man. To her, he was just another oversexed male. As for herself, she knew she attracted men, but she wasn't going to exploit that. She believed she had a responsibility to improve whatever talents God had given her. She knew she had some, and she was proud of it. And Amaro Ray? His naivete clearly came from his youth. That she had liked him showed she was a woman, and as far as she was concerned, there was nothing wrong with that. She also liked the fact that he had been broad-minded enough to have been attracted to a woman like herself. In battle, however, she knew Amaro Ray might be entirely different, and that combat might drastically transform his otherwise innocent personality. This logic, in turn, allowed her to realize that Amaro indeed probably had been the one who had nearly killed her. And from there, her own acute intellect quickly led her to a radically new conclusion. I liked you, Amaro, but I have to kill you. Shortly thereafter, the Madagascar took off from Abo Aku, supported by two Gatel fighter-bomber squadrons. In the meantime, on the Federation side, the 127th Autonomous had detected a second enemy force approaching. It was no surprise. The officers on the bridge of the Pegasus II had known they would run into more and more resistance the closer they got to the heart of Zeon territory. It's only been six hours since the last attack, right? Amaro said. Twenty-five degrees below the ship's starboard wing, he could already see the shapes of six or seven enemy ships. Know what I think, Lieutenant Commander McVeary said. I think there's finally been enough killing. When this campaign's over, the whole god-awful war is going to be over, too. Then he laughed and added, But don't worry, this time my men and I'll form your vanguard again, Mr. Amaro, and hurried out of the room. Amaro glanced up at Bright in the captain's seat above him on the bridge. Is McVary becoming a philosopher or what, sir? Well, Bright replied, over five billion people, that's with a B, over five billion people have died in the war, and that puts a little break on the population explosion. Maybe it's just McVary's backhanded way of saying that mankind may yet manage to overcome the biggest crisis of all time. Are you trying to say this war is just another form of population control? Bright looked at Amaro with an amused expression and said, I suppose that's one way of looking at it. Unable to believe his skipper's words, Amaro's anger showed. You've got to be kidding, sir. That's not what I'm fighting for. You want to stop? Stunned, Amaro just stared back at Bright. Mirai answered instead, coolly. While you're both philosophizing, the enemy is on his way here to kill us. Amaro's anguished voice rose in volume in response. I don't care if the skipper's joking, Mirai. I think that sort of talk's an insult to all the people who've given their lives in the war. Don't you? We're not living in a video game world, are we? How many points to kill another human? One? Two? How many points was Lala soon worth? Bright signaled Sela. She quickly read his meaning, stood up from her seat in front of the comm console, and came over to Amaro. Taking him gently by the arm, she whispered, You've got to calm down. Their bodies swayed in the weightlessness, but the pair reached out and grabbed a fixture and pushed against it. As they floated out the bridge exit, Sela said, You don't really believe they're serious about people killing each other for such a crazy reason, do you? Just think, by building the space colonies, we created room for billions more people to live. And life on the colonies has now stabilized. History can't go backward. 
I don't know, Sayla. There was a weird logic behind what Bright said. It's based on the idea that man's fundamentally rooted to the planet Earth, and that his population should be tied to it, too. But new types are supposed to transcend all that, right? They're not bound by archaic ways of thinking that force them to kill each other, right? Amaro headed for the flight deck, and Sayla followed him. When they boarded the flight deck elevator, and when they boarded the flight deck elevator, they were at last alone. She suddenly turned and kissed him. Amaro, she whispered, unless we somehow stop this war, new types will never really come into their own. You've got to fight in order to end it. If someone like you dies, the old ways of thinking are going to last forever. You mean we've got to win over the old types, right? Over the land-based faction, the Earth faction, the natives, whatever you want to call them. New types have to win over the people who don't realize that this war has become a habit, a collusion on a grand scale. I know what I'm saying is even more difficult than winning the war we're in, but new types are going to have to fight for a world without war. Listen, Sayla, do you think your father really believed what you're saying now? He never specifically told me anything like this, and I wouldn't have been old enough to understand it even if he had. But I do know our world's changing, Amaro. What you really mean is that we have to change it, right? Yes. I don't know anything about Lala soon, but maybe she was related to it all. Maybe new types can transcend normal empathy among humans, even normal modes of human communication. But they're still human. You follow me? I know. New types aren't espers. I know I'm just an ordinary human. If there's any difference between me and the people on Earth, it's... How should I say it? It's that the light of the stars is just as important to me as the Earth's air is to them. For people to understand each other in the vastness of space, we're going to need a lot more intuition and insight, and a hell of a lot more patience. We need those qualities all the time, but you're saying that in space they're especially critical, right? Right, but most people are still locked into old ways of thinking and don't understand that yet. Sayla suddenly looked at him, smiled, and said, You know, Amaro Ray, I think you're just the man to teach them. He looked her in the eye and smiled back. Sayla... Pretty sailor. Tell you what, I'll launch from the Pegasus and go fight today. Not for some high ideal, but for you. To protect you. How's that? She giggled. <laughs> In this day and age, words like those seem a little too romantic, but I'm not complaining. Go out and do your best, Amaro. For me, if you want. For me, if you want. And then when you come back, let's talk some more about what we can do. Then... Without saying a word, he bent his head and gently placed his lips on hers again. I just know that giggle came across as creepy, and I apologize. I can't titter or giggle in a high-pitched falsetto on command. <laughs> it's not as easy as it sounds. Uh, Tiny Tim, I am not. The second Xeon task force sent to destroy the 127th Autonomous consisted of two Shive class heavy cruisers, four Musai class regular cruisers, three Zakus, one squadron of small minesweeper like Jiko attack ships. And one squadron of small minesweeper like Jiko attack ships. Although the 127th was outclassed in number and firepower, McVary and Amaro's units lured the enemy into a well defined combat zone and annihilated them. Incredibly, the entire action took less than 15 minutes. Two of McVary's tomahawks were heavily damaged, but much to his relief, Hayato and Kai had. Hayato and Kriya had managed to rescue the pilots with their mobile suits. In times like this, McVary later admitted, laughing loudly, I guess those damned robot arms come in handy sometimes after all. And as for you, Mr. Amaro Ray, well, let me congratulate you on the fine job you did of training your men. From now on, lad, we'll work together like hand and glove. 
After returning to the Pegasus Bridge, Amaro quickly spotted Sela. They winked and jokingly flashed each other the V for victory sign. They did not know that with every victory, the 127th was, an att was attracting an ever more powerful enemy. So, as you can see, Amaro is really coming into his own. Um, one of the things I give uh, the original series and this book a lot of credit for is having what feels like an essentially believable progression and escalation in terms of uh, how the main character, the protagonist, just kind of gets better. Um, he does get lucky, and he is initially uh, kept from being killed by the machine he's piloting being top of the line. But that stops being uh, the case later on when you've got mobile suits that are better than him. Uh, and he's just gotten better as a pilot. And here you've got like the entire squad team dynamic going on, which is really cool. We're dealing with some full-blown new types here, Shar Aznable said, after demanding more speed from the Madagascar. They're steadily increasing their level of performance and aggression. With the Manofsky level rising and radio transmissions no longer practical, laser communications were the only means the Madagascar had left to track the Federation fleet movements, and even lasers required predicting in advance approximately where the target was going to be. It's going to be hard to find them, Shar said, but we've got to. If we don't stop them soon, Zeon's entire line of defense will be compromised. I know you're right, sir, the Madagascar's captain agreed, adding with what sounded like a groan, But you don't seriously believe it's the same unit that wiped out our two task forces, do you? Who else could it be? We're better off assuming the worst. That way, if we survive, we can at least break out the liquor and celebrate. By the way, any shoal regions ahead? Only one, sir. Corregidor. Does it cover a wide area? Yes, sir. Looks that way. Good, replied Shar, turning to leave the bridge area. We'll try and ambush them there. Now things get serious, he thought. Thinking about what his unit faced, he was both tense and exhilarated. Normally, he just wanted to survive the war, but this time, he knew there was far more at stake. Later, in the Madagascar's briefing room, Shar privately addressed the MS pilots in his unit. Times are changing, he began. I first began to believe in the new type theory because of the Gundam pilot, and I now know that new types aren't just a mutant form of humanity nor are they just a weapon. Let me confess to all of you right now, and to hell with my own personal goals in all of this, I think we're on the brink of a new era, a new type era. And because of that, it's important that none of you be killed. Understand? The Earth Federation has formed their own new type unit to use as a weapon against us. We will annihilate them. But beyond that, I want you all to refrain from senseless killing. Concentrate on destroying the weapons of war, and not the people. Too many people have already been slaughtered, and we need to end the war, not prolong it. And we need to end the war, not prolong it. I want you all to go out there and fight bravely, but stay cool, and keep your wits about you at all times. Cusco Al was moved by Shar's wor last words. She knew she would use whatever powers God had given her to their fullest extent. That was simply the way she was. As the pilots all headed toward their mobile suits, she donned her helmet and thought to herself, Amaro, if I run into you, I'll have to kill you, because by the time you realize who I am, it'll be too late. You won't be able to stop fighting. It's too bad, but that's just the way things are. She climbed into the Elmeth cockpit and frowned, for she knew her thoughts were only a means of covering up the growing nervousness she always felt before combat. It was true that if it weren't for the war, she would never have met Amaro Ray, but she had no time to think of that. With a growing sense of rage, all she could think of was that if it weren't for the war, she would never have been placed in such a wretched position. The Madagascar entered the Corregidor's Shoal Zone. I think that's how that's pronounced. C-O-R-R-E-G-I-D-O-R. -R -R -E Corregidor. 
Corregidor. The Madagascar entered the Corregidor Shoal Zone. While its Gatel fighter bombers took cover behind the huge rock fragments in the area, the seven new... Jeez, it's seven now. The seven new Rickdom suits in Char's unit deployed themselves with the Elmeth in the lead. Char's red suit came up alongside Cusco's Elmeth and plunged ahead together with it. Chalia Bull's Rickdom formed the rearguard. If the Elmeth's remotely controlled bit units could, destroy, could just destroy the Federation's Trojan horse, their work would be half over. Cusco, called Char. Do you read me? Loud and clear, Commander, she answered. The enemy will direct a... The enemy will... Okay. This is fine. The enemy will direct cannon fire and missiles at us before we visually sight them. Don't just rely on your intuition to evade them at first. Follow me until you get the hang of things. Then, when we catch up with the warships, they're all yours. Chalia, myself, and the other Rick Dom pilots will take care of the enemy's suits. Understood, sir, Cusco answered, and her face began to set itself in a mask of intense concentration. Chapter 16 The Elmeth Luna 2 continued circling Earth in its orbit 180 degrees opposite the Moon. In addition to functioning as a Federation fortress, the former asteroid now also housed several thousand civilian refugees from colonies, most of whom had been mobilized to work for the various supply units or local military factories. Among them was Frau Bo, Amaro Ray's former neighbor on Side 7. Although still in her teens herself, Frau was in charge of three young war orphans named Katz Hauven, Letz Kofan, and Kika Kitamoto, the oldest of whom was nine. Because they had refused to enter the local orphanage and instead insisted on staying with Frau, the officials concerned had reluctantly granted her custody. With the war still raging, and with her new situation and the need to earn a living, she abandoned her, she abandoned her long-held dream of becoming a fashion designer and decided to pursue a mechanics license. Aware of her plight, some friends with connections helped her obtain work at a local at the local military man, man why am i having difficulty with the sentence aware of her plight some friends with connections helped her obtain work at the local military ma vehicle maintenance plant life on luna 2 was hard but by no means miserable fra was young with a body resilient enough to recover when overworked and her three young charges loved her as if she were their own mother We brought you lunch, Frau! Kika's high-pitched young voice echoed through the maintenance area where Frau worked. Over a dozen mecha men, most graying at the temples, crawled out from under the vehicles they were working on to greet her. Well, said one worker, if it isn't little Kika again, we've been waiting for you, sweetie. Hey, Kika, added the foreman, doffing his military helmet and wiping his brow. What's up? You're three minutes early today. You guys make Fra work too hard, Kika retorted, sticking out her tongue. She needs an early break. Chuckling at the little girl's impudence, the workers in the plant gathered together, opened their lunch pails, and began eating. Kika, where's Cats and Lats? Frau asked. They're coming. They're still playing Space Invaders. Video games? Well, tell them they're to get here on the double. It's time to eat. Roger Dodger, Kika said, happily running off to fetch the others. As Fra watched her little charge disappear, she realized how long the little the girl's pretty blonde hair had become. She loved the sight of it, and was even a little envious, but she also knew she should cut it soon. She reached into her purse and fished out a compact. It was military issue and utterly lacking in any aesthetic quality, but she treasured it nonetheless. In the little mirror, she saw grease smeared on her cheeks. 
She took out a handkerchief, and, while wiping them clean, resolved to buy some lipstick when she got her next month's paycheck. In the force, the more mature waves often scorned those who wore lipstick or makeup, but Frau didn't care. She was still in her late teens, and she had rights of her own. She would do it for Amaro. For Amaro. The moment, she, the moment the thought formed in her mind, tears welled in her eyes, and as she watched in the little compact mirror, began rolling down her round cheeks. Amaro. She didn't care if he came back missing an arm or a leg, or even if he fell in love with another woman. She just wanted him to come back alive. The thought grew louder and louder in her mind. If only he would survive. In the future, he could make her cry or even make her angry, and she wouldn't mind. But if he died there, but if he died, there would be no future. Only memories. And her last memory of him would be their brief exchange over a vid phone as he departed from Luna 2. That was a possibility she couldn't bear to think of. Fra again resolved to buy her, lisp her lipstick. To buy it for Amaro. She slowly closed the lid on her compact. Hey, I was just about to break 3,000 points! Let's complained to Kika as the two of them ran over to Frau. Let's eat! they yelled. Well, if you're going to bring us lunch, you guys should at least be here on time, Frau gently scolded. Hey, it's Let's's fault, Katz whined, nonetheless taking out a paper napkin and wiping the hands of the, other two, of the younger two. Noting Frau's face, Let's suddenly piped up. You've been crying, haven't you? Now why would I do that, silly? Fra answered, opening up at lunch rations the children had brought. Oh no, not hamburgers again, they all chimed. We're at war, Fra said and again in a scolding tone. Think of all the poor soldiers out there who'd love to eat something as nice as this. You really think Zeon's that clever, eh? Bright asked the pilots assembled on the Pegasus II bridge. We've arrived at our rendezvous point ahead of schedule, so I say we ought to stay here until we can hiccup, hook up hiccup. <clears throat> I'll tell you about hiccups. We've arrived at our rendezvous point ahead of schedule, so I say we ought to stay here until we can hook up with the other fleets. The Corregidor Shoal Zone's an ideal place for us to hide. Well, the same's true for Zeon's ships, Amaro answered. Do you really think we can avoid being ambushed? Why would they ambush us now? We're the only squad in the area, and the Zeon warships coming out of Solomon are a... Solomon now are a... Uh. <laughs> Why would they ambush us now? We're the only squad in the area, and the Zeon warships coming out of Solomon now are ignoring us. The Principality wants to take on the entire Armada, not just us. That's the way they think, and that means they don't want to waste a single ship on us. That's assuming a lot, Skipper, said Lieutenant Commander McVary. The performance of the young MS pilot seemed to have impressed the veteran fighter pilot mightily, for he rested his arm on Amaro's shoulder and continued. With all due respect for your own new type potential, I disagree with your analysis, and I'm inclined to agree with young Amaro Ray on this one. Personally, I think there are enemy ships waiting for us. You really think an ambush is possible? said Bright. You said it yourself, Skipper, Hayato interrupted, speaking with far more conviction than usual. We got here early. That'll bring the enemy out after us. Especially the Red Comet. I bet he wouldn't pass up an opportunity like this. I think we ought to get through the Corregidor area as fast as possible, and then wait to coordinate our movements with the others somewhere else. Bright finally caved in. All right, all right. Looks like nobody has an absolute majority here, but you've convinced me. I'll buy your ambush idea. We'll go through the shoals, but on one condition. McVerry, I want you to agree to the lineup I've decided on. McVary grinned sheepishly, and then turned to look at Amaro quizzically. 
The skipper's known us longer, sir, said Amaro. So, he, so he's putting us out front. Looks that way, doesn't it? said McVary. He's deferring to you in a way, sir. I'm sure you can understand. He knows you've already lost four of your men. I know, Mr. Amaro. Deferring has a polite ring to it, but what it all boils down to is that the lieutenant doesn't trust me and my men. Amaro laughed. Sir, don't you think you're being a little too sensitive? Hell yes. But in the Tomahawk Squad, we have to be sensitive. We have to be on our toes at all times. I know what you're saying, sir, but I've gone up against the Elmeth once before, and I think it's better that I go up against it again. All right, all right, said McVary. In front of you, my fair-haired lad, I'll skip the bravado. He gave Amaro's rear end a light slap, turned and walked over to where his men were standing on the bridge, and the magnets on the soles of his boots, with the magnets of the soles of his boots, I can't talk. He gave Amaro's rear end a light slap, turned and walked over to where his men were standing on the bridge, the magnets on the soles of his boots making a pleasant clicking sound. You can be my wingman any time. Take my breath away. Do, do, do. It's very Top Gun. Amaro shrugged, as he, and as he turned back toward the captain's seat, he saw Sayla behind Bright. She had been watching his interchange with McVary and smiled. Next, Bright formally announced the lineup. Junior Grade Lieutenant Amaro Ray's G3, the gun cannons, and the gyms will lead the Pegasus. Lieutenant Commander McVary's Tomahawks will assume positions to our stern, starboard, and port. The Cypress and Graydon will follow, and the four VX-76 balls will form our rear guard. McVary saluted with a forced smile and left the bridge, his men following without protest. There was something about the way McVary handled himself that Amaro admired intensely. He had a masculine, charismatic quality that made men want to follow him. It involved principles and ideals, individual goals and a plan to attain them, and it all seemed like a mysterious art to Amaro. The only excuse he could think of for his own lack of leadership was his youthful inexperience, and the more he thought about that, the more inferior he felt. At least he secretly prided himself, pretty blonde at least he secretly prided himself, pretty blonde Sela had finally introduced him to the ways of manhood. That Amro could congratulate himself on such a simple matter in itself revealed his immaturity, for although youth does mature quickly through direct experience, a further test of maturity is the way the experience itself is interpreted. Whether it is glorified or accepted as a natural part of growing up. In his belief that his relationship with Sela had turned him into a more sophisticated adult, and in his growing conviction that nearly anyone could easily evolve into a new type, he was still frighteningly naive. To the other four pilots in his mobile suit unit, Amaro announced, Once we get through the Corregidor Shoals, we'll be resupplied. We take off in an hour. I want everyone to go out there and do their duty. He tried to choose his words carefully, but he noticed Kai and Hayato had smirks on their faces. They weren't deliberately trying to insult him, but he didn't like what he saw. Dismissed, he barked, immediately remembering he should have first asked them if they had any questions. Kai Shiden, always the jokester, couldn't hold back a laugh. Hey, Amaro, you don't have to get so uppity just because you're our unit leader. We'll still respect you. Amaro ignored his friend's remark and turned on his heel. Why was he so tense? He wasn't experiencing a new type premonition, or it would have manifested itself in a far more distinct format. But if this was a way for his musculoskeletal system to deal with pre-combat stress and anxiety, it wasn't doing him any good either. If Kai, Hayato, and the others hadn't been there, and if he hadn't been on duty, he would have liked to spend some time with Sela. But that wasn't possible now. The Pegasus was on a maximum combat footing and plunging straight into the Corregidor Shoals.
Along with the other MS pilots, Amaro climbed into his suit and performed a final check of his cockpit instrumentation. Then the face of Sela Mass appeared on his three-inch communication monitor. G3, she first announced. Junior grade a Lieutenant Amaro Ray. Are you ready? All systems are go, he replied over his mic. Currently at launch point. That was all Sela needed to hear, for her image immediately disappeared from his monitor. Faster than normal, it seemed. Was she deliberately ignoring him? Didn't women feel any special emotion at a time like this? he wondered. Then, in the next instant, he heard Petty Officer First Class Callahan's high-pitched voice. G3, stand by for lunch. Ready? Three, two, one. G3, now launching. The catapult mechanism beneath the Gundam's feet surged forward with a roar. He felt the G-force, and a second later all man-made objects disappeared from view on his main screen, and he found himself looking at millions of stars in a jet-black universe. C-108! C-109! Over his receiver, Amaro heard the call signs of the other mobile suits behind him mixing with a rising level of static. The Gundam's autopilot system established the correct distance to precede the Pegasus, and the other suits fell into formation. "'Secondary combat speed!' he called out. He fixed his gaze on his main screen. A huge boulder loomed before him, and then vanished to his rear. They were in the Corregidor Shoal Zone. The Elmeth cockpit was roomier than that of a mobile suit, and Cusco Al rather enjoyed sitting in it, waiting. Her instrument, p- her instrument panel glowed faintly in the darkness, and outside the only light was that of the stars around her. With the sun out of sight, they seemed to be burning brighter than ever, densely matted in a world of black. She saw the faint red shadow of Char's Rickdom next to her appear to drift slightly. I wonder if he's noticed, she thought, but decided not to dwell on it. In the weightlessness of space, it seemed absurd to perfectly position anything. The universe would be a lot nicer if men weren't so power-hungry, she muttered to herself. She hated it when Shar and Chalia Bull started talking so righteously about the Zabi family and their own plans. It made her want to throw a monkey wrench into their schemes. She smiled at the thought. Perhaps, subconsciously, that was a reason she had taken a liking to Amaro Ray. It wasn't just because she had sensed new type potential in him. She really had thought he was cute. As if triggered by the association, she suddenly sensed something. With her right foot, she gently pushed down on an activator pedal and aligned her Elmeth with, with Char's Rickdom. He seemed to have sensed something, too. Amid static... She could make out his fuzzy image on her calm monitor. Twelve o'clock, Cusco. Elevation zero. Understood, she replied curtly. She yanked back on the left and right steering levers, and the Elmeth rose steeply, bursting from its hiding place in the shoal zone. The six Rickdoms followed. Simultaneously, the Madagascar readied its cannon for attack. Cusco gradually accelerated her Elmeth, cursing the men around her. Politics! Politics! They ought to think more about what it means to be a new type. Then she released the twelve remote-controlled bit units carried in the Elmeth's fuselage. As if on cue, beams began stabbing toward the Elmeth from in front of her. For a second, Char's Rickdom was highlighted by the glare. Cusco! His voice barked over her speaker. Concentrate on operating the bits. I'll cover you and the Elmeth. Thanks! She had registered the relative position of the bits in her mind, and they were already charging forth toward the enemy she visualized. Bits were configured with either a megaparticle cannon or a nuclear warhead, and operated under a system of remote control that used brainwaves amplified and projected by the Saikamu interface. Since Minovsky particle interference had made radar-based guided weapons impractical, they were the only remote-controlled weaponry that worked effectively in space. As Xeon and Federation forces converged at high speed, all thought of Amaro Ray disappeared from Cusco's mind. 
The 12 bits headed for their targets, and their built-in video cameras recorded images that were amplified and projected by the Saikamu directly back to her brain, where they became an integral part of her vision. It wasn't hard to control the bits. Humans easily recognize and act upon visual information from multiple sources simultaneously. Cusco Al merely demonstrated this ability on a far more advanced level, controlling the bits through the Saikamu interface. There was a linear order to the visual Whoa Yep, no. There was a linear order to the visual information from each of the bit units, and her cerebrum merely had to reflexively differentiate and exert control over it. Then Cusco saw the Federation's Gundam model mobile suit. In the same instant, suppressed thoughts barged back into her consciousness. Was the suit really piloted by the young man she had found so attractive? By Amaro Ray? She hadn't really received any solid information to that effect, but she felt somehow certain it was true. And during her seconds of confusion, one of her bit units was destroyed. A light stabbed deep into her, cere into her cerebrum, and she knew that the Gundam had taken a shot at her. She swore. She knew she was in trouble if she had to directly confront the Gundam. Her survival instincts, and the primeval fighting instincts that had qualified her for combat in the first place, would automatically assert themselves over all other thoughts. She began to feel pure hatred. For the Federation. For Zeon. For the war. For the male society that caused it. She was ready to fight. As Shar watched, a rocket whooshed out of the Elmeth into the darkness, leaving a long trail from the blue-white cone of light billowing around its nozzle. It happened so abruptly that even he was shocked. Cusco, he shouted into his microphone, pushing his red rickdom to catch up to the Elmeth. Don't rush yourself! As if the Elmeth's actions were the trigger, Chalia Bull led the other suits forth. Huge flares spewed from their skirted cowlings, for Rickdom engines were said to be equivalent in power to those of Cosmo cruisers. And at the same time, the MS unit's mothership, the Madagascar, sailed out from the shelter of a huge asteroid, firing both cannon and regular missiles in the anticipated direction of the enemy approach. The ship's massive Fife nuclear missiles, mounted up both port and starboard, possessed such awesome destructive power that they had to be used before... Uh, let's try that sentence again. I think at this point they don't care about the Antarctic Treaty. I'm pretty sure they've just given up on that. The ship's massive Fife nuclear missiles mounted both port and starboard, possessed such awesome destructive power they had to be used before the opposing fleets of ships actually came into contact. Crewmen often claimed they could shake the whole universe, and when the first one launched, even the Madagascar seemed to shudder. In a blaze of light, a fife soared up past Shar and his men toward the enemy. Oh, this is cute. I had kind of forgotten about this little scenelet. This is actually a, kind of a nod in its way to, um, uh, what was it, the, the, the bit of uh, the animated series, uh, I think it was part of Operation Odessa, where Makuve um, uh, has a nuke get launched against the Federation forces. And this is kind of a, uh, a nod to that. Amaro Ray sensed something coming straight for him, and during a second of confusion he wondered if it were an auxiliary remote unit or an incoming missile. Then, as his mind suddenly cleared, he intuitively knew it was a missile. Unlike the leaping, relentlessly advancing impression generated by an Elmeth's remote units, missiles normally created a linear pressure in his consciousness and were thus easier to deal with. But if this were a missile, it felt unlike anything he had ever before experienced. It seemed to possess far more power. He knew his comrades couldn't hear him, but he shouted out, Kai! Hayato! Leave this one to me! 
Then, lining up the sights on his beam rifle with the crosshairs on his main monitor, he shifted his aim 0 0.3 degrees to the right. And in that instant, several bursts of light erupted around his Gundam. Kai and Hayato had destroyed a couple of the attacking remote units from the Elmeth Forum. He gave silent thanks and knew they were buying him some time to concentrate his entire being on the incoming missile. And then he knew it was a fife. The first shot from his beam rifle hit home. The fife exploded and blossomed into a giant, roiling inferno. The blast occurred in the middle of the two approaching fleets, but it was still powerful enough to make the mobile suits of both forces shudder. The light from the explosion was sighted by Federation and Xeon warships several combat zones removed. Amaro, furious, drove his Gundam forward toward the enemy at full speed, but as he did so, he saw the unique leaping light of several more Elmeth bits bearing down on him from both sides. He wasn't in the mood to put up with any more attacks. He swung the Gundam fuselage left and right, and fired two blasts from his beam rifle. Light from the exploding units streamed toward him, and he aimed the Gundam in a downward trajectory in their direction. With a shock, he instinctively realized that whoever was piloting the Elmeth this time was even faster than Lala Soon had been. He was awed by the way the attacking units slid toward him, and the way they timed the blasts of their megaparticle cannons and he felt an intense mental pressure when they approached. While Amaro had no way of knowing, the thought waves amplified by the Elmeth system's Saikamu interface originated from Cusco Al's subconscious fighting instincts, and were projected in all directions. They appeared inside his own cerebrum like a moving black shadow, creating a powerful force, a wall of sensation. What is it? A chill suddenly ran down his spine. At the same instant, Cusco Al yelled, What's going on? Commander Garcia Doal of the Flanagan Institute had once confidently said, the Earth Federation putting new types to real use? Total fantasy. Don't worry about it. Ensign Lala Soon's Elmeth? That was just a prototype. It was just bad luck that the enemy attacked when the system hadn't been perfected yet, when she was in the middle of a test flight. She was killed in the line of duty, but it was practically an accident. It was amazing, Cusco now realized, how different reality appeared... How different reality appeared to combatants on the front lines and theoreticians in the rear. Survival required an utterly different mentality from that of the desk jockeys. On the battlefield, nothing was constant. Nothing was certain. She had closed in on the Gundam enough to clearly make out its form. But to her horror, before she could get a good look at a f b b b b but to her horror, before she could get a good look, a force screamed through her mind. It wasn't light. It wasn't an audible voice, and it wasn't the force from a nearby explosion. But when it hit, it felt as though the skin and the hair on her head were being ripped off by a gale force wind. It seemed like a hallucination, but it felt real. It was real and it enabled her to avoid the next threat. She saw a light from the direction of the Force, and she made her Elmeth soar upward, just as several beams nearly zapped her from below. She willed her seven remaining bit units to attack the Gundam MS, and at the same time aligned the sights of her Elmeth's twin megaparticle cannons. And then she saw Char streak by her in his red rickdom. Just in the nick of time, she thought. Char, too, began firing his bazooka at the Gundam, and a light from an explosion even greater than a Fife missile overwhelmed her main monitor. She wondered if it were all over. Was that Amaro? she thought, feeling suddenly detached. If so, well, that was it. Too bad, Amaro, but it was your fault. You were shy and cute, but you treated me like dirt. If you were really the Gundam pilot, the slate's wiped clean now. Come to think of it, there's something nice about that idea. I guess we might have been together, but it just wasn't in the cards. 
But the battle was not over. Another powerful force roared through Cusco's mind. She opened her mouth wide and screamed. And screamed. <laughs> Cusco Al, pull back! She heard a voice loud and clear in the midst of the roar. It was her commander, Shar Asnable. Pull back immediately! Without thinking twice, she put the Elmeth into reverse so suddenly that, despite triple shock absorbers in the cockpit, the G-force slammed her body toward the instrument panel in front of her. But she was well trained, and never once took her eyes off the main screen. Is that... is that really the Gundam? Her eyes widened. She could clearly see the enemy MS, illuminated by the light of an explosion, charging straight toward her, its gold-colored eyes flashing, glaring menacingly right at her, through her main monitor, through the sun visor on her normal suit. In a twist of logic, her fear was cancelled by rage. The mysterious pressure in her mind earlier had been like a shock wave, a form of mental rape that altered her thought patterns and rattled her psyche. And if such an unwanted, unpleasant sensation happened to have come from the Gundam, well, she was not about to forgive anyone. She turned the Elmeth's twin particle cannons, twin mega particle cannons, on the charging suit and fired, but to her astonishment, it skillfully dodged her attack with a movement uncannily like a human body English. Her chestnut hair practically stood on end as she screamed, It's a two-way street, Gundam! You tried to kill me! Now it's my turn! I'll turn you into dust! Inside the Gundam, cold, oily sweat beaded on Amaro Ray's brow and soaked his flight suit undergarments. If he were going to die, he thought, he wished it could be under more comfortable conditions. The Elmeth quickly filled his field of vision, and each time it fired its cannons he was surrounded by light from heat-emitting particles. That it was an oddly beautiful sight bothered him. It was absurd to feel beauty in something so deadly. He had no idea how he managed to avoid the beam blasts. He just knew that to escape from the force trying to envelop him, the force being projected at him from the Elmeth pilot through the Saikamu interface, he had to close in on the Elmeth itself. It was a realization that spurred him on, for with it, and with a little faith in his suit, he knew he could survive the attacks. You won't be able to use the remote units this time! he yelled inside his cockpit. He fired his rifle three times, and each time powerful beams of light scorched through the blackness toward the Elmeth, but each time it leapt out of the way. He spun the Gundam fuselage, trying to keep on top of the weaving enemy machine, and in the process its metallic green image shifted from his left monitor to the main display. He was now directly opposite it. He pulled the trigger of his rifle and fired. The Elmeth started to swoop below him, but he had anticipated the maneuver and brought up the Gundam's left leg, smashing it into the Elmeth's prow. Under normal conditions, what he had done would have appeared comical. His MS was humanoid, and he had, in effect, kicked the enemy. But his MS was also a, mo a weapon of war, to be used as he saw fit. The shock of physical contact reverberated through the Gundam cockpit, and Amaro saw the Elmeth shudder. And in the same instant, he felt a powerful force bearing down on him simultaneously from both his front and rear. Could it be the Elmeth's remote units? Since he was attacking their mother machine, they were surely out to get him. In the force pressing on him, he could detect a single thought. Kill him! Could the pilot again be a woman? Several beams stabbed toward him from behind, but he anticipated them. Putting his suit through an ear-grinding, bone-jarring maneuver, he managed to absorb the brunt of the attack directly with the shield in the Gundam's left hand. Whomp! The Gundam shook violently, and the impact nearly knocked Amaro unconscious. He kept his eyes open, but realized he hadn't been looking at his monitors or instrument panel. When he did, he saw glowing beams. 
and he saw an interaction among them, some sort of wave force controlling the beams. The waves created an undulating arc in space that quickly seemed to envelop the Gundam. He tried to scream, but couldn't. His physical body wouldn't cooperate, and only an inaudible, breathless cry erupted from the depths of his spirit. The Vulcan cannon in the Gundam's head belched and destroyed an incoming bit with a nuclear-tipped missile. Both the Gundam and the Elmeth were swept along by the blast. He cursed, but he kept his eyes open and again saw the flow of waves he had noticed earlier. He knew he was up against a formidable enemy. Staring straight at the Elmeth remote units weaving toward him, he fired three shots from his beam rifle. With the light from the earlier nuclear blast still illuminating the area, three more explosions occurred in a clump. The Gundam and the Elmeth were now locked in a close-range duel that quickly became a raging inferno. In a matter of seconds, the battlefield was transformed from a conventional one, where isolated beams stabbed back and forth in the darkness, to a spectacular light show. The firepower was so awesome that to both Federation and Xeon warships in the area, it looked as though not two machines, but the entire mobile suit units of both forces had smashed into each other. Charlie Bull, with a direct view from the rear of the action, could only whisper in awe, The Elmeth and the Gundam. The two machines clashed again and again. Of course, I'm getting a phone call. Give me a sec. This is important. Sorry about that. Being on call has its disadvantages. Where were we? The two machines clashed again and again. And explosion after explosion occurred, but as with fencers in ancient times, whose supporters would stand by and watch them duel to the death, at first none of the older suits and other suits in the area dared intervene. Both Xeon pilots in their rickdoms and the Federation pilots in their gun cannons and gyms held back, perhaps fearing their suits would instantly be destroyed if they jumped into the fray. But Kai Shiden and Hayato Kobayashi knew what sort of battle Amuro was engaged in, and both had the same idea in mind, to make sure no one else interfered and thus give him time to dispose of the Elmeth. Taking the initiative, they boldly plunged ahead of the other Federation suits, Kai yelling, Don't let the fireworks distract you! More Zeon suits are on their way! The ones with the flared skirts! Hayato gingerly maneuvered his gun cannon below the battle zone, while Kai took the higher position. But someone had already snuck into the area. As far as Shar Aznable was concerned, he was already too late. 
When a missile-bearing bit took a direct hit from the Gundam, he was too close to the explosion and was temporarily disoriented as a result. Damn, he swore, reminded again of the frailty of human flesh compared to machines. Cusco Al was locked in close combat with the Gundam, and appeared to be determined to destroy it at all costs, even if it meant her own destruction. Incredibly, she had even involved the remaining remote bits in the close-in fray. The blasts from the particle cannon in the Elmeth were like screams of her frenzied fury. Cusco, stay calm, he yelled, training, his, training the sights of his beam bazooka on the Gundam but he couldn't keep his aim steady. The enemy suit, moving with blinding speed, was locked in a weird acrobatic dance with the Elmeth and, the t and two bit units, firing beam blast after beam blast and giving him no room. Char then realized that he was witnessing what he had seen once before with Lala Soon, only this time the effect was even more powerful. It was as though the two combatants, their mutual wills locked in mortal combat, were exuding a force powerful enough to physically shut him out. Perhaps, he thought, it was because of the Saikamu interface. Perhaps it could not only amplify human will, but even project it as a type of power. He knew he had no choice. He had to act to save Cusco, even if it resulted in the destruction of the Elmeth itself. Beams from a bit unit were already being deflected by the Gundam and striking the Elmeth. He had to get to the gun he had to get the Gundam away from her. He let the energy collect in his Rick Dom's beam bazooka. The Elmeth crossed in space above his trajectory. Then the Gundam. Then the two of them crisscrossed vertically at blinding speed. He fired and saw an explosion. He blinked, wondering if he had scored a direct hit but then he saw the Gundam's smashed shield and watched the enemy. Oh, sorry, there's not a period there. He blinked, wondering if he had scored a direct hit, but then he saw the Gundam's smashed shield and watched the enemy's suit slide back behind the Elmeth. With a yell, he fired a second, then a third blast. The powerful verniers in his Rickdom helped him twist and turn in space, and for a moment it looked as though the three machines, the Gundam, Elmeth and his own Rickdom would smash into each other. The next moment, Shar swore at his carelessness. The Gundam's left arm, which normally held a shield, reached over its shoulder toward its backpack beam saber hilt and swooped forward. In an instant, a saber blade formed and connected directly with his Rickdom's left leg. For half a second, the Rickdom and the Gundam were physically joined, but then the saber sliced into the leg like a sword into flesh and bone, particles from the beam exploding in light. Shar groaned, his lips curling in an unvoiced curse. He lowered his beam bazooka and fired blindly at the Gundam, but it had already begun to move out of his line of fire, toward the rear of the Elmeth. Reluctantly, he eased off on his trigger finger, and then heard a WHOMP as an explosion thrust him upward. He looked up at the upper left... Yes, he looked up at the upper left instrument panel in his cockpit, and to his dismay saw that an explosion had occurred in the damaged portion of his Rickdom's leg. He had no choice but to disengage. To his surprise, he also heard a strange ringing in his ears. He glanced at his, at his main monitor and saw the light from another explosion fill the screen. Cusco! he yelled. He knew the ringing in his ears was no ordinary ring, that Cusco had entered a state beyond his control, and that there was nothing more he could do. The ringing was also from the Gundam. There would be no retreat. He began working feverishly to remove the Rickdom's smashed leg from its socket. Cusco Al's thoughts had already been infiltrated by Amaro's. Her hatred and rage had escalated to the point where she was doing far more than controlling the Elmeth's twin megaparticle cannons and remaining bit units. Nearly half of her energy was radiating out into open space, like ripples spreading on the surface of a pond. 
but the accuracy of the three weapons she now controlled was increasing rather than decreasing. And they were all trained on the Gundam. Amuro had to depend on the Gundam's new magnetic coating to help, him ev to help him evade the attacks, but the Gundam was still a mechanical system, a machine, and he knew there were limits to its endurance. It simply wasn't capable of keeping up with the speed of his reflexes. And he knew the same was true of the Elmeth and its remote units. He projected an idea deep into Cusco Al's expanding wave of thought. If you want to stay alive, retreat! Amaro's thought jolted Cusco with far more force than he would ever realize. She felt something bordering on physical pain deep in her head, and such an intense chill ran through her that she felt as though her brain matter would explode through her nose and eyes. The Saikamu, which normally amplified and projected her thoughts, was now working in reverse, receiving and amplifying Amaro's. Retreat? She recoiled, resisting his demand with all her might, and her thoughts were broadcast back to him. And then Amaro at last knew. Cusco, it's you, isn't it? It's you, isn't it? He remembered her chestnut hair and the seductive aura of her smile. But he was angry, and his anger was amplified by a twisted sense of shame. Why in the world should Cusco Al, of all people, be piloting the Elmeth? That question in turn triggered another thought in him, a lie, an attempt to erase his shame. I never really wanted to sleep with you that time. You did, she responded, and you should have said so, boy. I would have said yes. The word boy caused Amaro to lose the final remnants of whatever self-control he had left. He screamed, Boy, you think we're playing kids' games here? This is for keeps! His beam saber sliced through the last surviving bit unit, and the light from the explosion illuminated the Elmeth, its cockpit, and Cusco inside her normal suit. Her smooth skin was covered in sweat and trembling with fear, but to Amaro, she seemed to be laughing at him. You're finished, Cusco! He sighted the Gundam's beam rifle on the front of the Elmeth, but then, to his shock, the same thing that had happened during his confrontation with Lala Soon happened again. With what felt like a physical force, he was jolted by a thought wave from Shar Aznable, trying to defend Cusco. No, she's not finished, Gundam! Shar, don't try to stop me! If you do, I'll have to kill you too, just as your sister asked! Artesia? Get out of here, Shar! I've got a score to settle with Cusco! Cusco Al had not laughed at Amaro. She had lost control of her bladder and bowels and vomited against the sun visor of her helmet. Yet through the horror of it all, there was something she realized— that she could give herself to Amaro completely, unconditionally. It was both a powerful thought radiating out from her and a premonition of her own destruction. The enemy energy pulsing from Amaro had ripped her psychic sense of balance to shreds and left in its place an intense awareness of him as an individual. So it was you, wasn't it, Amaro? The thought of him gave her a second of peace that transcended the earlier moments of sheer hatred. To rush madly forward with the Elmeth and die in battle with the Gundam began to seem absurd. It would be preferable, somehow, to take the passive route and let Amaro destroy her instantly with his beam rifle. Goodbye, Amaro. The same instant, a torrent of thought waves poured out of Amaro, and the muzzle of the Gundam's beam rifle exploded in flame. The same instant Cusco Al saw the flash and confronted her own death, Amaro saw a mysterious light flow from her. It appeared silver in color. And then he could hear her singing, singing something about London. London, of all things. London Bridges. London Bridges, 
London Bridge is down, down, falling down. London Bridge is falling down, my fair lady, my fair lady. He heard a woman's voice overlaid on that of an infant, a beautiful woman, a fair lady. Could it be Cusco's mother? Then he heard an aria and a violin being played. Was it her father? The hand of a strong but gentle man touched the strings of the violin, saying, Cusco, honey, that's not the way to do it. You're a half torn off. You've got to push down harder with your pinky. And her fingers ran up and down the neck of the violin. And Bach's air on a G-string formed a gentle curve and disappeared, wavering into the silver light. Build it up with wood and clay, wood and clay, wood and clay. Build it up with wood and clay, wood and clay. My fair lady, my fair lady, my fair lady. Then Amaro saw Cusco's pale fingers holding a pen and writing in a diary. He saw the letters she formed. They were distorted, and they, too, disappeared into the silver light. But as he felt, but he felt as if he had glimpsed her innermost forbidden secrets. No! No! Stop! Cusco Al's gray pupils widened with terror and horror, and a young man's voice cried out, I love you, Cusco! I love you! You've got to believe me! Oh, sorry. No, that's not him. Okay, so what's happening is replay of her memories, and I botched it. My bad. But he felt as if he had glimpsed her innermost forbidden secrets. No! No! Stop! Cusco Al's gray pupils widened with terror and horror, and a young man's voice cried out, I love you, Cusco! I love you! You've got to believe me! No! No! Stay away from me, you filthy pig! London Bridge is falling down, falling down, down. London Bridge is falling down, my fair lady, my fair lady. Stop! Stop! It was almost a scream. And what Cusco Al saw, Amaro saw too. A laughing man, a Federation soldier, plunged a bayonet into the belly of her beautiful mother. Her father lay bludgeoned to death in a pool of blood. You swine! As Cusco's scream spread out into the silver band of light and disappeared, Amaro again saw through her eyes, saw the face of the same Federation soldier. Grinning, a cigarette clenched between his tar-stained teeth. Build it up with wood and clay, wood and clay, wood and clay. Build it up with wood and clay, wood and clay, my... Fair lady, my fair lady, my fair lady. It was then that Amaro realized the enormity of what he had done. He had committed the unpardonable sin of killing someone he normally would never have dreamed of hurting. He had lost control to the war, to the technology of the machines, to the whole situation. But it was no excuse. Cusco Al had already been incinerated. He wept and choked out the words, Cusco, my fair lady! After the Elmeth exploded in a giant ball of light, the Xeon and Federation MS units finally closed in on each other in full combat, and the Federation ships, Pegasus, Cyprus, and Graydon, began dueling with Xeon's Gatl fighter bombers. It was an equal match in terms of firepower. 
The Madagascar was a mobile cruiser, and it and the Gattle Squadron were not about to fall easy prey to anyone. Lieutenant Commander McVary and his six surviving Tomahawk fighters, for their part, braved the raging barrages and made a lightning strike on the enemy. Meanwhile, Amaro avoided two blasts from Char's Rickdom and unleashed a few rounds with his own Vulcan cannon, but then he was forced to start retreating from the area. The other Rickdoms were closing in on the Pegasus, and he had to stop them. But Char wasn't about to let him. Why did you do it? As Char charged toward him, leaping around some of the space debris in the area, Amaro finally regained his presence of mind. He knew the enemy suits would have a hard time destroying the Pegasus on their own. If he turned around, he was confident he could take on Char, but he knew Rickdoms were different from Zaku's in terms of both speed and firepower, and he could feel Char's own energy targeted straight at him. Over his receiver, Amaro thought he faintly heard a woman's voice somewhere crying, Sarkis! Sarkis! Had Sarkis McGovern, the gym pilot, been destroyed? Then he heard a roar and a wham inside his cockpit. The beams used by the Rickdoms formed slowly, and were so broad and powerful that even a near miss could make his suit shake violently and throw off his sighting. But it wasn't a beam. Looking out from the Corregidor Shoal area, he saw what appeared to be a large nuclear explosion in the distance. And then he heard Shar Aznabal saying, Is it true, Amaro? Amaro was incredulous. Federation and Xeon MS pilots were battling to the death, yet here they were, still capable of talking to each other. Even in the midst of his duel to the death with Cusco Al, he had had verbal communication with her and he had allowed a personal grudge to violate his belief that combat should always be depersonalized. His comment about Char's sister had also been on a private level, not the sort of thing one normally tossed at an enemy in the heat of combat. And he had no way of knowing how much his words affected Char. Affected Char. It's not possible to lie on this level, Char. If you don't believe me, ask your sister, Artesia. He had no way of knowing if Char received his thought, but the Rickdom's remaining leg rose up and turned. Amaro filed, fired his rifle. The blast went wild, and he aimed again. And then it happened. His entire beam rifle destructed in a flash of light. Damn, he thought. Another, different Rickdom that had fired at him was coming at him, floating upward out of the darkness from below and to his right. Realizing it was trying to cut him off, he again put his suit into retreat. Lieutenant Commander McVary and three of his tomahawks never returned from their heroic mission. Nor did Ensign Sarkis McGovern in his gym. The Graydon was destroyed, as were all four of the ball machines. Back on the Pegasus II, Bright Noah looked up at the ship's screens at the expanse of the Corregidor Shoals unfolding before him. "'We took quite a beating,' he, mu he muttered. "'But, sir,' Sela commented from behind him, as if to console him, "'at least we destroyed the Elmeth and three of the enemy's new skirted suits. We also annihilated the Gattle Squadron and inflicted heavy damage on their warship.' "'She's right, Skipper.' Mirai added, while still manning the helm. I'd say it was a draw, and that we held our own. And we collected quite a bit of data on Zeon's new Elmeth machine, sir. Marker, Marker, seated, chimed in from the boom crane chair above Bright. Don't you think, he continued, looking down at Hayato, that for all intents and purposes we've wiped out half their new type unit? If Zeon has two or three more units like that one, Hayato answered, the entire Federation's in big trouble. We wouldn't have been able to stop that Elmeth attack if... We wouldn't have been able to stop the Elmeth attack this time if it hadn't been for Amaro. I see your point, Bright said softly, gazing at his crew. When Amaro finally spoke, it was with bitterness. 
No, that was Xeon's only new type unit. Bright looked at him and frowned. It's time for some rest, pilot, he ordered. You'd better ask the medic for a tranquilizer. Yes, sir, Amaro saluted. Then he turned around and asked Sela for the battle report. She walked over to him and handed him a large file. None of the other pilots were yet interested in it. The, they were simply happy to be alive, to have survived, and in groups of twos and threes they started filing out of the bridge area toward their quarters. Amaro, still holding the unopened file, watched his friends leave, and then turned toward Sela. "'You knew the Red Comet was out there, didn't you?' he said. "'I knew,' she said. "'I could see him.' "'I told him what you had asked. I think he understood.' Without warning, Sela slapped Amaro across the face. The Pegasus II and the Cyprus rested briefly outside the Corregidor. Outside Corregidor, in a few hours, the code words for the final attack on uh, attack on Aboaku, play the Chembalo, would be signaled to the entire Federation Armada. And that is the end of the second book of the Mobile Suit Gundam novelization trilogy, Escalation. Next week, we'll get started on Confrontation, the final installment, um, the final volume. Um, let's see, where are we? Oh, yeah, that'll be suitably dramatic. Gosh, golly gee willikers. Yep, that'll be where we'll call it uh, there next week. Planning ahead. And the, yeah, probably three segments, roughly. 40-ish pages each, I figure. Oh, wait, no, it's going to be more like four. Yeah, it's going to be four segments. Next week's will probably be the longest of the lot. We'll figure it out. Anyway, uh, that, is, uh, that is that. And uh, things got rather nasty there at the end. But... Uh, Time's the breaks. War is hell, kids. Uh, sorry about the technical issues earlier. Um, no one is more displeased about them than I. <laughs> um, as well as the interruption uh, towards the end there. Um, but it is what it is, I guess. Inane as that is to say. Uh, so yeah, next week we will continue with this. Um, I haven't yet decided what I'm going to do uh, for Mecha Mondays after we finish reading this, uh, the Mobile Suit Gundam novelizations. Uh, perhaps I will do one of the Robotech, uh, novels. <laughs> for giggles. Um, yeah, probably the first one is, is good enough. Um, I'd like to do both at some point, but, uh, we'll, we'll start with the first one. Both of the, both of the ones that cover the, uh, uh, the adaptation of uh, Super Dimensional Fortress uh, Macross, that is. Uh, the novel, the Robotech novels are actually quite good, uh, by and large. They're not perfect. Sometimes they try, later on particularly, like during the Sentinels portion, they try to be uh, too edgy for their own good, and it winds up being kind of like, <laughs> you're trying way too hard. Um, but the uh, the ones that cover the adaptations uh, that were done, uh, the uh, initial season of uh, Robotech was Mobile, uh, Mobile Suit, uh, Super Dimension Fortress Macross. Second one was um, Super Dimensional Cavalry, Cavalry, Southern Cross, and the third is Genesis Climber Mospita. They're adaptations thereof. They have different names in Robotech for those arcs. Um, Suffice it to say, uh, Harmony Gold uh, did an Americanization of those series and tried to turn it and turn them into the all one overarching continuity uh, to mixed mixed success. Um, say what thou wilt about their adaptation of the source material, 
Uh, but the thing we should really be upset with Harmony Gold for is uh, maintaining a death grip on the Macross license for decades and doing nothing with it and keeping uh, Macross stuff from being released in the West. Uh, now that's been partially dealt with, but they still uh, they still retain some distribution rights, which is aggravating. Um, especially since they honestly don't care. They don't. Also, hold against them... Um, oh, jeez, what was that called? Chaka Zulu, I think it was called. Um, where they uh, did all this filming in Africa and then proceeded to not pay anyone. Um, there's probably a fascinating story to be told about uh, the interactions between Haim Saban and uh, what's his name? I think it's Frank Agrama. One sec. Yeah, Frank Agrama. Yep, Farouk Agrama. <laughs> um, that's right. Uh, he's from he's from Egypt, um, originally. Uh, there's some absolutely fascinating uh, overlap between the two, Haim Saban and uh, or Haim, Haim Saban and uh, Frank Agrama. It's like absolutely. Absolutely fascinating stuff. Oh, he died last year. It's not to speak ill of the dead, but uh, <clears throat> not a huge fan. <laughs> uh, this guy did like tax fraud and a few other things. Pretty pretty nasty stuff, um, as well as uh, over overlapping with uh, Silvio Berlusconi and a few others. It's it's pretty wild. Like it's pretty wild the circles that uh, this guy was in. Um, I'm not saying he was he had connections with Jeffrey Epstein, but I wouldn't I wouldn't be terribly shocked if that turned out to be true. <laughs> I'm just saying there's an aura of skis. And the way uh, Harmony Gold as a company is run is extremely indicative of that. Um, I'd love I'd love to put together the story of that, but that would require actual effort on my part, so that's not likely. I'm lazy. <laughs> Hence why these don't get edited much. Anyway, uh, that'll do it for me. Um, if anybody's listening to this after the fact, uh, I do broadcast these live, live, live in front of a live studio audience of whoever's tuning in that day. Um, starting at noon uh, Eastern Standard Time or East Coast U.S. time. Um, usually I'm a couple minutes late, so just be patient with me. <laughs> um, I, I stream on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Uh, this year, uh, 2024, is uh, the year of me doing just books, on those, just reading on those days. So... If you're into that, great, you're getting more of it. If you're into it to watch giant robot video games or or what I used to do, which was Warframe, um, on Wednesdays, uh, then regrettably you're not going to get much of that this year, but who knows what next year holds. We'll see if we can sustain this. Anyway, um, with that I'm going to dip. Thanks to everyone who tuned in. Um, yeah, Shaka Zulu, that's the one. Um... That's the one. Sorry. Uh, that's the one that Harmony Gold worked on. Anyway, uh, I'm going to do it. Thanks for tuning in. Stay safe, stay sane, and uh, be decent to each other. And, uh, you know, don't get caught into uh, combat bloodlust and, you know, use your uh, totally not psychic will to bludgeon someone into... Uh, into non-functionality and then shoot them to death. You know, don't do that. That's kind of lame. Amro's kind of a jerk. Um, but uh, he kind of knows that. And he's really just got a great way of communicating with people. Yeah, I told your brother that I that you said to kill him. And she's like, what? <laughs> You're not supposed to do that. 
Anyway, he say he's kind of an idiot. <laughs> One of the things I give Tamino a lot of credit for is uh, consistently portraying all his human characters as being pretty deeply flawed uh, in, in, in some way or another. Um, even when they're the protagonist, even when they're relatively good people, they're, they're fairly flawed. He also tends to show moral, you know, be, be sort of gray, you know, where there can be redeeming factors for even villains uh, to an extent, but Girin is not one of those. Don't worry. Girin is consistently a complete bastard, but, you know, megalomania. Anyway, I'm going to dip. Thanks again. Have a good one.